My name is Matthew Nagos, and this week I will be presenting to uh, all those lucky people out there who get to listen to me talk for uh, a few minutes. Um, I I don't have a lot of specialized knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge, in regards to learning disabilities. I don't have experience as a, diagnosti a diagnostician or a teacher. The real reason why I'm doing this workshop, this video, is to, to educate parents and students about being a student. Um, one thing I'm very familiar with is living with a learning disability. Uh, I have dyslexia, and recently I got out of law school and, and over the course of years figuring out when I had dyslexia to when I graduated law school, I worked really hard to develop skills to overcome my learning disability. Now some of those skills were you know, just working hard and putting my notes to the grindstone, but some of them utilized assisted technology. In fact, over the last 10 years, I found a lot of ways to use assisted technology, and I still am, am developing those assisted technology tools, um, I guess you can call them professional accommodations, in my professional life. As somebody with dyslexia, I still have to work, I still have to make a living, and I use accommodations every day in my, in my work, personally, at home. And so I'm, today I'm going to talk to you about, you know, as a student and as a professional, what kind of things I use to help me be a better worker and be a better student with dyslexia. I guess we'll go ahead and get into it. Uh, I'll go ahead and kind of give you a little synopsis of my journey. I first figured out I was dyslexic in the fifth grade. Um, in the fifth grade, I was formally diagnosed. I think early, early on, my mom had some inclination that something was going wrong. Initially, she thought I was an amazing reader. But when I started reading books to her upside down, she realized, oh, I wasn't reading it. I had just memorized these books, and I was reciting them from memory. So... Come fifth grade, reading is real difficult for me. I'm having trouble finishing tasks on time at school. I'm having trouble getting my readings done. I'm having problems with my teacher. There's conflict there. And my mom knows that I'm trying really hard and, and living with me. She knows what I'm capable of. But there's something missing. And when I went to a diagnostician and I was tested for dyslexia, the puzzle pieces fell in place. We figured out what was going on. And from there, I started figuring out how to deal with it. Uh, I think one of the big steps forward for me was in junior year of high school. And that's really when I started discovering assisted tech. Uh, that's when, you know, I began writing a lot of essays. That's when the reading for school really picked up. And if you didn't read everything that you were supposed to, you, you really fell behind. And so kind of just out of necessity, I figured out, okay, there are some technologies out there that really can um, help me be a better student. And also, at that point in time, I really learned the, the benefit of you know, communicating with teachers and how that in itself can be a really helpful tool. Uh, my biggest step forward in figuring out assisted tech, I think, would have been my junior year of college. That year, I started, um, I declared myself as a history major, and I started getting a lot of my reading assignments in PDF format. And that's when I learned something amazing, that if you can highlight something and copy it and paste it, it can be read to you. At least that was the case in oh, 2008. Now in 2020, almost 2021, you don't even need to be able to highlight it. There are so many tools out there to assist you with reading. But in junior year of college, I really figured out that if you can digitize something, if you can get access to it on your computer, it really opens up a lot of doors. In my second week of law school, I went to undergraduate uh, school at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, and then I went to law school at SMU. My second week of law school, I committed to digitizing all of my books. If I needed it for class, I made a digital copy of it, I edited my notes digitally. I did everything digitally. And it really transformed the way that I studied and the way that I interacted with my readings. Now, one big barrier to a lot of kids that 
the learning disabilities community has done um, a lot of work on and made a lot of headway in is making things accessible. I know that Learning Ally is a really popular program that a lot of kids get access to, um, particularly through their um, state learning institutions, uh, middle school, high school, or college, be it private or public. A lot of schools, if you have a learning disability, are more than happy to give you access to something like uh, Learning Ally. There are a lot of popular ebook and audiobook um, accessibility websites. Bookshare is very popular. Overdrive uh, is, is popular. I use Kindle and Audible quite often. Now, as somebody who no longer has access to you know school accommodations, I have to pay for those things. But for some people, they really enjoy Kindle and Audible. And like Learning Ally, uh, Kindle has a way for you to pair what you read with what you hear. Same with Learning Ally. You can see something read to you as you can hear it being read, which is a really cool tool. Um, open eBooks is, is popular. iBooks through Apple. Um, one thing I'll say about iBooks versus Kindle is that iBooks allows you to really copy something and have it read to you. Uh, Kindle, for, for copyright reasons and for control reasons, you can highlight text, but it can't be read back to you. Once it's highlighted, you can either make a note or you can color that text, but you a lot of programs that would open doors for people with dyslexia or maybe ADHD, they can't use it with Kindle, but we're going to talk about some ways we can get around that. And I know through the Amarillo Public Library system, a lot of students, not even students, anybody can get access to Cloud Library, which is uh, an ebook um, access site that you can uh, also get access to on you know your computer and, and smart devices like iPhones and iPads or any Android-enabled device. Now, what happens when you have materials or when you have something you have to read, but it hasn't been made accessible? Over so many years of school, there have been plenty of times where Bookshare didn't have what I was looking for. Learning Ally didn't have what I was looking for. Um, maybe I could get access to it uh, through a Kindle ebook, but there are a lot of protections on those that prevent you from really interacting with them the way that you want to. And just in general, a lot of these these really great tools have their limitations. You know, there is something about having free access to your book. When you have a paper book, you can make notes in the margins. You can color it however you want to. You can star things. I mean, there's just a lot of things as a student you have, you're able to interact with a book in a way that you're just not able to interact with a lot of uh, the ebooks that are made available to students. So one of the things that I found out I could do very early on is just make my own ebook. And I do this using scanning tools. I've got a number of tools listed here. Um, I, I should know that there are a lot of good tools that are uh, more expensive. Abbey Fine Scanner is an example of those. It requires a monthly fee. But there's ones like Scanner Pro that require uh, one small payment and that are actually very, very useful. I'll go ahead and demonstrate how I would use Scanner Pro at school and honestly on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we're going to take a look at uh, a book that some of the listeners on this may have actually read in high school. It's going to be George Orwell's 1984. Now I'm on my phone, I'm just going to go to my Scanner Pro app, I'm going to hit the, the I'll go back and I'll show you, you can see I use this on a day-to-day -day basis for a lot of things. I, I scan quite a, a lot of personal documents, a lot of work documents, but if I turn to, to page one, I'm just going to hover over the page, it automatically captures that page. Now I found some tricks to to scanning sometimes it's a an art more than a science flip the book upside down to get another scan and this is the first two pages of chapter one of 1984 and I'm going to go through and, and edit it real quick sometimes it auto uh, detects the size incorrectly so I'm going to change that to 
It's a letter. And I scanned this one upside down just so I could get a cleaner scan because it was easier to hold the book. So I'm going to go ahead and flip that back around. So now I've created, I mean, for all basic purposes, my own ebook. But this app lets you do one more task that is just absolutely amazing for people with, uh, with learning disabilities. And it's this Recognize Text OCR. I'm going to click that, and what this app is going to do, it's going to identify the text that I just took images of. So you can see that I have now just made that text searchable. I've made it usable. I've enhanced this document in a way that is, is going to reap a lot of benefits. And I'll show you exactly how we benefit from that. Um, I've got this app connected to my personal Dropbox. So we're going to go ahead and head over to my Dropbox. It is November 1st. The scan I took is right here. I'm going to open it up in my preferred PDF editing software here on my Mac. And I can highlight text. I can make notes in the margins here. Um, I, I love this. You can quickly change colors when you get into more complex um, text analysis that becomes really uh, beneficial I can say I can mark something as important um, I, hopefully I'd spell it correctly next time but I can just you know add things to text that you could regularly do in a book with pen and paper and highlighter well now I'm doing it with a computer program and what's even better is now that I've made this text usable, I can have the computer read it to me. And that's what is, in my opinion, the most useful thing for students with learning disabilities, is that you can actually see what you're using. It's going to be the same text that most of the students in your class are going to be using. They're just going to be using the paper version, but you can look at it, you can have it read back to you, and we'll go over some tools to... To, to listen to text like this after you've created your own ebook, so to speak. Um, there are additional OCR options uh, that you don't do through your phone. Now, I will say the, the three scanning tools I've listed here, all of those have OCR capabilities. Um, when you're trying to run a lot of documents through your phone, sometimes I would scan 50 pages at a time. Um, it can really jam up your phone and it has to process all that information. So sometimes it's easier to just scan everything, upload it to your computer, and then run it through an OCR program on, on your computer. My favorite over the years has been Adobe Acrobat Pro DC. Uh, it is something that you have to pay for if your, your learning institution um, won't pay for you to have a subscription. Um, Abby Fine Reader is one that's uh, very powerful and a little more expensive. And kind of honorable mention is Google Docs. It what it will do is it will take a PDF and turn it into a usable uh, Word document or Google Doc. So it it allows you to interact with it differently. Uh, it's it's tougher to make the the notes and margins of Google Docs like I could do with a regular PDF, but it's free. So if you're a student looking for um, things that you can access without having to pay for, that's a really cool tool, and it, it's something that I want to mention before we move forward. Now, if you don't take anything away from this, uh, this video, pay attention to this slide, because I'm going to show you two apps that I think for any student with a learning disability, they should really consider um, getting. The first one is called Snap and Read, and this program is is absolutely phenomenal. You know, I told you that Kindle doesn't make documents easy to use, and I'll I'll show you what I mean. So, I can highlight things, and if I was using a, I'll go back to that PDF. Um, I'm going to show you a program that we'll use a little bit more later in this presentation, but if I Go to this PDF document. I'm going to highlight this line right here. 
and I'm going to have my computer read it to me. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. Boiled cabbage and old rag mats. That sounds disgusting. Well, it's really cool, despite the fact it sounds disgusting, the computer's reading it to me. And that's really important for a student who has a learning disability. But I'm going to go to my Kindle that I have access to through my browser, and I can highlight it, but I can't copy it. And because I can't copy it, my computer can't read it back to me. But Snap and Read has found a solution to that. This is an extension you can download into your Chrome or Edge browser. It may work with other browsers, but I know it works with Chrome and Edge. Um, I'm going to click this screenshot reader. I'm going to drag it over the area I want read to me. I'm going to wait just a couple seconds. And the computer will take it from there. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At one end of it, a colored poster. You can do this with any website. If I was on Wikipedia and I was um, doing research for about George Orwell, and I could just take this cursor, move it over a set of text, and it will read one. whatever is captured in that highlighted area. I mean, this is such a cool tool one that I really wish I had access to when I was a student. One that I use on a daily basis just because it makes life easier for me since I still struggle with reading comprehension. Now I will say it is a $4 a month subscription to get access to Snap and Read. Uh, if you have a learning institution that is willing to pay for this, um, you, you may be able to get Snap and Read without having to pay a cent. Um, but it eliminates the need for that OCR program that I talked to you about. Another really cool program, this one's actually an app, is called Claro Scan Pen. Now we're gonna go back to my phone. This app only requires one payment of around $10. Um, I'm gonna pull up Claro Scan Pen. I've got my book right in front of me. I'm going to take a photo through the app. Now that I've taken the photo, I can run my finger over the text I want read to me. Now, because of the way I have my phone hooked up, you can't hear this, but generally, this application would read whatever I had highlighted. Now, say it's, it's done reading that, I'm going to go to the second groups of lines, and it's going to read that. This is absolutely amazing because it takes anything that you can take a photo of, if it's actual text, and it turns into something that can be read to you. I freaking love this app. Um, it's only $10. It works really well with small groups of text. Sometimes when you try to highlight a whole bunch of things, you can see that you know my thumb was over that and, and things get a little bit jumbled. But I'll tell you where this really comes in handy. It really comes in handy with students who want things like tests read to them. Um, there are other means of having tests read. Sometimes uh, schools will allow for a student to have a, a proctor who will sit there and actually read questions out loud to them. But everybody has access to a smartphone these days. And it, and it kind of takes the embarrassment out of having something read to you. You can do it yourself. And empowering... Um, students with learning disabilities to be able to do things themselves is a great feeling both for the parents and for the teachers who are working with them and particularly for the students. Um, the last thing I want to point out are scanning pins. It, uh, scanning pins are a, a very cool device. Um, oftentimes they're a little more pricey. I know that the West Texas A&M Center for Learning Disabilities has at least one of these. So if you're interested in, in playing with one and seeing how it works, uh, get a hold of the center, and I'm sure somebody can set up uh, times where you can come in and, and check out the device. Um, it's larger than your typical pen, and it's, um, in my opinion, a little awkward to use, but particularly for students who are taking tests and who don't want to have a, uh, a proctor reading over them, it's a really great tool. Uh, it's a little more expensive and in general harder to access since um, 
I mean, when you compare it to an app that you can pull up on your phone, but I do want to, to point it out. Now, what happens when you've created a text that can be edited? I've created this, this two-page document. It's the first two pages of Chapter 1 of 1984. I need it read to me. Well, there are a lot of tools that people don't realize that are on their computer that they could be using today. Um, the first is... Mac and Windows, they have accessibility tools. They have text-to-speech features that allow you to listen to anything that can be copied from a document. Windows and, and Mac or Apple have been working extremely hard to make their computers more accessible to people who are blind uh, and to people who have disabilities. Um, in, in this instance, I'm, I'm using a Mac and all I'd have to do was go to the settings on my computer, go to this area called accessibility, and I go through and all these things are tools that you can use as a student um, to, to have text read to you, to be able to speak text into existence. It's called speech to text. But Windows has all these features too. Some of them are, some platforms have features that are easier than others. But I would just recommend that if you have a PC or if you have an Apple computer, to get online and to research the accessibility tools on that device because you'd be really surprised at what your computer is already capable of. And the next thing I want to talk about is, is Chrome and uh, Chromebooks. Google Chrome has a, a text-to-speech feature that works extremely well. And there are a lot of things about Chrome that I love that are particularly good for students. One is that you can use it on any computer. I'll explain how it works real quick. You know, when you buy a cell phone, it comes with apps already installed onto it. Well, using Google Chrome and your Google account to access Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Sheets. That's kind of like buying a cell phone with apps already installed onto it. Well, you can then get more applications that work with uh, Google programs. So I can get text-to-speech apps added to uh, Google Chrome. I can get speech-to-text apps and OCR apps, all these different things that are typically free. You can add them to Google Chrome and use them to interact with different documents. One of the things that is really remarkable about Chrome is that um, it's web-based, so I can access it on a Chromebook, or I could access it on a PC, or I can access it on a Mac. And if I work on a document um, using Google Docs and I save it to my Google Drive, I can then go to a different computer and pull it up. Uh, I think it's a pretty remarkable platform. It, it makes things like Word and Excel and cloud storage accessible to people who don't have the money to pay for more expensive tools. And Google is becoming way more used in, in schools around the country. A, a lot of classrooms are now embracing Google-powered devices and, and Google operating systems. So your school may already be using uh, things like Google Chrome for teaching purposes. So it, it could be a, a seamless integration between you and your classroom. Uh, the last one I want to talk about is Natural Reader. This is one of my favorite apps. Now, I've already showed you the, the power of Snap and Reading and Claro Scan Pen, but Natural Reader is another one of those um, programs I have just fallen in love with. It's, it's free. You can download it onto any Mac or PC. Um, they've got this very cool dyslexic font feature. I don't know what dyslexic font is. Um, supposedly it helps. I'm sure there's some science behind it. But you can type something into this and have the program read it back test, to you. Test, test. You can change the speed. Uh, you've got a number of different languages and a number of different voices. If you pay for the more expensive version, you can have more natural voices, but computers have been talking to me for years, 
So I'm fine with this uh, computer Alex voice. But the real great thing, the real gem about this program is this mini board feature. It'll stay on top of any document that I'm using and I can highlight the text and I can have it read back to me. T was a B N G H T cold day in April, and the clocks were stricken G thirteen. Wins Hunt Smith, his chin nuzzled one end to his breast in an ep So you can see how that works. Now I want to point something out. When you were hearing that text, you probably were a little confused. This was reading words that we're wrong. And so let's look at it again. T was a B N G H T cold day in April. You can see that when I ran this through the OCR program, it didn't recognize everything perfectly. And I want to point this out. This is oftentimes the difference between uh, phone based applications and computer based applications. Computers just have more processing power and oftentimes recognize text better. So you can use things like Scanner Pro, you can use those OCR functions, but oftentimes if you scan something and then run it through a program that's actually on your computer, it's going to do a better job recognizing the text. So if that's the path you want to use moving forward, that was the path that I used for many, many years, it may behoove you to look into things like Adobe Acrobat or other programs with an OCR feature that actually can exist on your computer rather than having your phone process that information. You know, getting back to the topic at hand, Natural Reader works really, really well. Let's go to a Word document that I've been um, working on. If I minimize this, you can see that my natural reader box is still right there. I'm going to copy the text. I'm going to have it play it back to me to make sure that what I wrote is what I intended to write. I, general purchasing and installation procedure for retest and rehab. A, step one, a unit is received and in. So, so far that sounds good. It, it looks good. It's a really easy program to work with. Um, it interacts well with uh, web browsers. So I used Wikipedia as an example earlier. If I was reading a Wikipedia article and I was able to highlight and copy that text, I could then have it read back to me. Something else I want to point out too is this read aloud feature that is now in Word. If I go to review and read aloud, general purchasing and installation procedure for a lot of uh, Microsoft products now have that read aloud feature and it's really good for students who are trying to edit their own work. Wanted to point that out. It's not in the PowerPoint but it's something that uh, is a really nice tool. Now note taking. One of the things that really transformed the way that I interacted with my books is by having them all in a PDF format. And because they were on my computer I had to figure out how to interact with those PDFs. I had to figure out how to take notes on those PDFs and to highlight and to, to add my own annotations. Um, there is this electronic advantage I like to talk about. Your, your access is improved because all of your readings can be located in one place. You can save them all to the cloud. So theoretically, you could access your readings on any device that is or has internet capabilities, your phone, your tablets, any computer, as long as you could get onto the web and access the cloud, you could access your readings. Uh, it makes storage so much easier. Instead of walking around from class to class with a whole bunch of books, you have your computer. And when I was in law school, I was piled, you know, sky high with books that I had to read. And people would walk around slouching because the books were so heavy in law school. Well, I eliminated that problem. I scanned all of my texts, so I walked around with my computer. And then there's this enhancing usefulness feature to electronic texts. Um, let's go back. I want to open up a, a document that I actually used in law school. So this is a chapter from a, a white-collar 
crime class that I took. Uh, this is chapter 11. It's on tax fraud. So say I have to write uh, some type of memo or an essay on, on tax fraud, and I'm looking for a specific thing in this chapter. I'm looking for maybe evidentiary standards. So I, I want to go through this document and find all the times where it mentions evidence. I'm going to type that in, and because I made this document searchable, because I ran it through an OCR program, specifically I ran this document through Adobe Acrobat, I can find all of the places where evidence is mentioned. So, oh, instead of having to reread everything and pour through it, maybe I didn't take great notes. Well, that's not a problem because I already found this area where it discusses sufficiency of the evidence standards. That's the kind of thing that you get with an electronic enabled text. And it's something that actually benefits students that don't have learning disabilities. I mean, I think there's a lot of students who would love to comb through their readings like this. Um, there are just other benefits uh, to the ones that would help students with learning disabilities. The, the programs I would recommend, uh, Adobe Acrobat, again, I've already talked about. Um, it, it's a, a great program for its OCR feature and for its um, PDF highlighting and editing uh, capabilities. Uh, Mac, I, I like to, I really like to use PDF Expert on PCs. There's another uh, program called Drawboard PDF that I think is a, a pretty good program for highlighting and adding annotations. And then there are, I'll mention all these, these three right here require you to pay for them. The next ones I'm going to talk about, they're absolutely free and they're actually very good programs as well. You have to access them through a web browser, which means you likely are going to have to have access to the internet to use them. Um, my two favorites are Kami Sejda, or th these two, Kami and Sejda. I hope that's how you pronounce it. Um, Small PDF is a another good web-based program, but you know, as the name suggests, it works better with smaller PDFs. Uh, Kami and Sejda requires you to either upload a, a PDF from your computer onto the web platform or sometimes you can grant the the websites access to your Google Drive or maybe your Dropbox and you can edit things without actually having to upload them and then re-download them but those are some of my favorite PDF editing softwares that you could use as a student who needs to mark up texts now moving from reading to writing, there are a lot of tools that makes writing easier for people with dyslexia or people with ADHD. Uh, writing was really difficult for me until I found some of these tools. And in fact, despite my challenges with writing, despite the fact that I spelled horribly, my spelling is horrendous, my, my syntax is, is not great. But despite these issues, my the, the accommodations that I found with tech really helped me develop a love for writing to the point where I almost became an English major in college. Um, again, I, I told you that Macs and PCs often have their own speech-to-text features, their accessibility features. So I would, if, if you have a PC or a Mac, go online and just do a quick Google search to, to see how you access those. Um, Google Docs has a really strong speech-to-text feature. Uh, it, it may be more powerful than the one that, ones that you can access on Macs and PCs. Uh, I'll give you a, a quick tip. If you're ever going to use speech-to-text or speech-to-text software, always use a microphone. If you're using the mic on your computer, it catches so much extra noise and it, it causes your um, your program to not work as well if you're trying to write a word and it's picking up other ambient noises that may change the way the computer hears that word you're gonna have to go back and and retype it and I just want to note that there are other speech to text to or text to tools available uh, if you want to go research them but speech to text, in, in my opinion, is is really limiting uh, for a lot of practical reasons. One, if you're a student and you're sitting in the back of the class and you're trying to type an essay, the students around you 
aren't going to want to sit there and listen to you speak to your computer. Uh, the same goes for the library or the coffee shop. And in places where there's a lot of additional noise, it makes some it makes speech to text tools work less effectively. So, in in a, a practical sense, speech to text isn't always um, going to be a an option for students who are looking for accommodations. Now, if you're a student or uh, somebody working, you know, professionally in their own office, if you have some privacy, hey, use speech to text all you want. But just on a practical level, there are a lot of barriers to make this a, a practical accommodation tool. Editing um, software was a really big find for me. In college, I used a program called Ginger a lot. Uh, now I use one that I prefer called Grammarly. I think both are pretty strong uh, editing, ad additional editing tools. Um, one thing that I'll mention is if you're somebody with a learning disability and you are editing your own writing, always listen to it first. Um, I, I have speech to text written here. It should be text to speech, but use text to speech as an editing tool. That natural reader program. Whenever you write something, I do this constantly. Go back, highlight it, and have the computer read it back to you. Because you'll be amazed at the number of times your brain will read what you intended to write, but your ears will catch the mistake. It happens to me all the time. Sometimes I'll read or I'll listen to an email twice before I send it because I end up catching mistakes with my ears that my eyes and my brain don't catch because that's where the, the, the disconnect with dyslexia often occurs and with people with focus issues you know that really really helps now you can get access to a lot of different accommodation tools now the real next task is not getting access to those tools but implementing access to those tools at school. I recommend to a student at home to use whatever assisted tech they like and they can get access to. Um, I remember I had a, an argument with my teacher in the sixth grade, my math teacher. I had a, a, a verbal disagreement with her in front of other students. I got upset because I couldn't use my calculator during a test. And in front of me, in front of the rest of the class, she goes, you know, Matthew, you're not going to have a calculator on you for the rest of your life. So you need to learn how to do this without a calculator. Well, I hate to brag, but I actually won that argument at the end of the day because I walk around every single day with a calculator in my pocket. That's called my cell phone. And I pull it out all the time to to calculate tips or to, to do simple uh multiplication, subtraction, division, and the, the reality is in 2020, 2021, if you are a student, there are very few instances where you are not going to be able to access the things you use to accommodate uh, your, your disability. As somebody in the workforce today, I use accommodation tools all the time. I use Natural Reader on a daily basis. I use um, Snap and Read, and sometimes I use the Claro app that I discussed earlier. I use editing tools daily, and they really um, brought me to the, the level of my peers who don't struggle with a lot of the issues that I struggle with. And in fact, sometimes it's made me a better writer than the students or the, the people that I work with. But home is not really where the problem comes in. It's at school. So for parents and for students, you just have to know you are, at the end of the day, legally entitled to accommodations if you have a learning disability. Title II and Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the uh, Rehabilitation Act outline specific protections for people with learning disabilities. Now, those aren't the only two laws. 
There are other federal laws and other state laws, particularly under the Texas Education Code, that provide specific protections for people with disabilities, for people with dyslexia, for people with ADHD. The understanding what you're entitled to exactly can be really confusing. I wouldn't recommend going through and reading the Texas Education Code. It is very dry and will put you to sleep pretty quickly. But know this, this term gets passed around a lot. If you have a learning disability, you are entitled to reasonable accommodations. Now, what does that mean? Reasonable accommodations is a pretty vague term. And oftentimes administrations and schools love the fact that it's vague because they can argue, well, the accommodation that you're asking for isn't reasonable. So when you are moving forward and trying to get accommodations, uh, there are some steps that you can take to make sure that your, your school is giving you the accommodations you deserve. Um, there are some implementation tools that actually have some teeth. And one of those is the 504 plans. And I, I apologize for not putting this in the slide as well, but there are other plans that you can get through special education that will outline for a student the exact accommodations and modifications that the student is legally entitled to. Now there is a legal difference between what is an accommodation and what is a modification, and there are different rules for under what laws you get those modifications or accommodations. But really what you need to know as a parent or a student is that there are legal devices and there, there are plans, there are forms that you can fill out and you can submit through your school that will outline what your accommodations are. So if you ever have a teacher or an administrator who says you can't do that, you can point to the plan and say, Aha, actually I can because under this plan I'm legally entitled to it and you as a education institution need to comply with it, are legally bound to comply with the plan. Now there are other ways of implementing accommodations and sometimes that's just working with teachers and administrators to get the accommodations you need. Now I would I wouldn't, I can't emphasize enough the, the benefit that a 504 plan can give to a student. Um, I will admit that oftentimes these plans can frustrate teachers and administrators. That's just kind of the reality. There are some institutions that have no problems with students who are asking for accommodations, but that is not always the case. Sometimes our education community doesn't like it when people ask for things they don't believe are fair or necessary. The reality is that they are fair and they are necessary, but not everybody agrees that they are fair and necessary. Um, so sometimes having a 504 plan is, is really great because it has teeth. If you have one, um, education institutions are required to comply with it. But there are times where you can just work with your teachers or administrators to get the accommodations you need. One thing I really want to stress is if you're a parent or a student, don't be afraid to contact the Center for Learning Disabilities if you have a question. If you are somebody with a learning disability, you need to get over, if you have a problem contacting somebody and asking for help, get over that now. Because one of your best tools is asking others for help. And the Center for Learning Disabilities has so many educated people there who know the law, who understand how to construct these plans, who have worked with educators in the past, and they know what you as a student should ask for. They know how to get you diagnosed. They know how to work with administrators to get the accommodations you need. So don't be afraid to ask for advice. Don't be afraid to reach out to people who understand learning disabilities and say, hey, we're struggling. Can you help us out? Um, my experience was I didn't know about the 504 plans when I was going through uh, high school and middle school. I, I went through or to a private 
middle school, and I know private schools uh, are not obligated to give you accommodations in the same way that public schools are. But once I got to public school for high school, I really lucked out because I had a lot of teachers who were just willing to work with me. And I, I told them about my diagnosis. I, I talked to them about the things that I was struggling with. And a lot of them, you know, gave me time and a half on tests or gave me other accommodations that at that point in time, I, I knew would help. Uh, one of the problems with that approach is that it's it's hard to document informal accommodations. Something like a 504 plan comes in handy when you're a student who wants to take the ACT or the SAT and you're asking for an accommodation. Well, if you can show that in high school and in middle school you received this accommodation, testing organizations are much, much, much more likely to grant you the accommodations you requested particularly if you received those exact accommodations in the past. Another tool that I want to point out to parents and to students for kind of justifying the accommodations that they're requesting is the Dyslexia Handbook that's published by the Texas Education Agency, and in particular the 2018 update. Now this document can be found online. It's the 2018 update to the Dyslexia Handbook. It's it's not a, a legal treatise. It doesn't have any binding effect. Schools don't have to follow the guidelines that are in this handbook. But what it does is it this handbook is kind of a, a culmination of things that uh, experts have have looked at by a, a state agency. So they're they're state employee or they're state workers who looked at dyslexia and came up with, uh, an, or they outlined the laws that protects people with dyslexia and they outlined recommendations for schools to, to work with students with dyslexia. And there's a segment of this handbook that is, in my opinion, extremely powerful. And it's on page 54. And it says that accommodations are not one size fits all, which is understandable. And that's not always great for students because it kind of gives administrators a little bit of wiggle room to say, well, this accommodation may not fit you. But it goes on to say, individual students determines the necessary, or sorry, the impact of dyslexia on each individual student determines the necessary accommodations, and these are examples of reasonable accommodations within the classroom. Audiobooks, text-to-speech, speech-to-text electronic spellers, electronic uh, dictionaries, and adoptive learning tools and features and software programs. We have covered all of those today. That's exactly what OCR programs are. We've talked about speech-to-text and text-to-speech. We talked about features within programs like spell check that can really help a student who's struggling with learning disabilities. So this is a state entity coming out and saying that these things can be reasonable accommodations for a student. If you're a parent or a student who's going in and wants to talk to a teacher or an administrator about enforcing accommodations they have in a 504 plan or just getting accommodations in general, I have some recommendations for you. First is know exactly what you want. Don't go in and say, well, we need accommodations. Go in and say, I as a student need access to text-to-speech when I'm doing certain activities, when I'm taking a test. Um, I, as a student, need time and a half. And if you're a parent going in and advocating on behalf of your student, know exactly what you want to request. Additionally, you need to be, articula you need to be able to articulate why that accommodation is reasonable. One of the things that helps is supporting literature. So maybe you could reference that dyslexia handbook particularly page 54. Recommendations from a diagnostician are extremely helpful because you know that some teachers and some administrators are going to look at you as a student or as a parent and say, of course you're requesting this. They're going to roll their eyes and they're not going to take you seriously because you may not have a lot of education, um, formal education in regards to how learning disabilities affect the human brain. I don't. 
I may have a legal degree, but that doesn't make me a doctor, and it doesn't make me a it doesn't give me any specialized training on what a student should get if they have a learning disability. But if you get a diagnostician to write a letter saying that I have diagnosed this condition within the student and I recommend that they get time and a half on tests or that they get to use a text recognition uh, speech or text to speech device when taking tests, that is a professional opinion that a school is going to have a really hard time um, ignoring. And, and finally, before you walk in, just sit down and think about what is my explanation for why this requested accommodation levels the playing field for my student or for me as a student or for my child? Because that's what a reasonable accommodation is. Reasonable accommodation is something that's supposed to help even the playing field for students who have a learning disability. And if every student in a class can read at a high school level, but you're like me and you're a 29 year old who still reads at a middle school level, it really isn't fair to expect me to perform certain tasks at the same speed and just as efficiently as another student who doesn't have you know, neurological problems that, that prevent them from processing information the same way. Doesn't mean I'm less intelligent. It just means that some of my parts don't work the same as the other students' parts. So know how whatever you're requesting, be able to articulate why that evens the playing field for you as a student or as a parent for your child. Be your own advocate. And, and know when to pick your fights. You know, not everything is is as important. If you have an assignment that's due the next day, it's not going to reflect heavily on your grade and your teacher doesn't want to give you extra time, maybe that's not where you pick your fight. But when you have a semester test coming up and your teacher says, no, you can't get time and a half on that, that's important. It's important for you as a student, and if you're a parent, it's probably equally as important for you. So that's when you really need to step up and you need to advocate for them yourself. And for parents, I would really suggest that you empower your children to advocate for themselves. Teachers don't always love to get into aggressive conversations with parents. And when a parent comes in advocating for their kid, those conversations can get a little bit heated. And it really empowers the student, if, if they can go in at the beginning of the year and meet with a, a teacher and say, hey, I'm allowed these accommodations, or I would like these accommodations, can we talk about how that's going to play out throughout the year? And it's important for students to develop that skill at a, an early age, because if they go to college, or if they go into the workplace, which are places that are protected under the um, Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, the Rehabilitation Act, you need to be able to express to either your college professor or your employer why you should be allowed an accommodation. And, and you as a student need to be able to, to work with others to make sure that, you know, moving forward, when your parents aren't there, you know how to advocate for yourself. And the last real important recommendations I have for both students and for parents is to document. Document, document, document. If you are a parent, I wouldn't trust your student to or your your child to do this necessarily. If you're a student and, and you think you can keep up with this, do it. But it, if you're a parent, make sure this is happening, that a digital journal is being kept outlining what accommodations your your child is getting. It lists each semester, all the classes that were taken that semester, the teachers who taught that classes, and any formal or informal accommodations that were given or denied. Because one thing that is really great is if in two years somebody wants to not deny your student, um, you as a student, or your child an accommodation, 
if you can go and show that in the years where they were granted this accommodation, they succeeded like other students, and in the years that they weren't granted the accommodation, they struggled. It makes whatever the accommodation is more reasonable. It kind of adds um, some, some foundation to whatever your argument will be. And digitize all of the documents that you collect that are relevant to your learning disability. Collect your diagnostician reports. Anything that you have received from a professional stating or describing your learning disability and how it affects you, keep an electronic copy of that. Store it in the cloud. Keep your 504 plans and keep copies of your report cards so that you can go back and reference them and say, you know what, in these years where I wasn't given accommodations, I, you can see a clear struggle with my grades. And in the classes and in the years that I had accommodations, you can see my grades pick up. I, oftentimes when you are applying for accommodations for the SAT or maybe the LSAT if you want to uh, get your law degree, they require you to submit these documents um, to the organization. So if you are a parent and you have those and you can just pass them along to your child, it will really help them in the long run. Because I can tell you from a personal level, going through boxes of documents, looking for my old diagnostician reports is not a fun thing to do. And if you're worried about getting additional time, it can kind of be a stress stressful process. But at the end of the day, those are my recommendations. I think assisted tech is absolutely amazing. It's changed my life as a student. It's changed my life as a professional. I know that I wouldn't be as successful today if it wasn't for the technology that I found to help assist me, assist me with reading and writing. I really hope this helps. If you take away nothing, look into Snap and Read, look into Claro ScanPen. Those are two great tools that aren't overly expensive that a lot of people can get access to that could really transform the way you interact with with books as a student. Uh, I, I hope this helped. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach me. Uh, my email address is mnigos at gmail.com. And if you have any questions, reach out to the Center for Learning Disabilities. There are a lot of amazing people in that center, and they are there to help. If you are trying to construct a plan for a formal plan for accommodations, or just a plan in general to deal with the issues that you're having as a student or as a parent with a student with learning disabilities, the center is there, it's got the tools to help, and it's got the people to help. Uh, enjoy this month of November. I uh, hope you make it to the end of 2020 because it's been a crazy year. I appreciate you listening, and have a great day.